All right, internet, welcome back. So we're gonna mix it up a little bit. This, uh, this iteration of videos, I'm gonna focus on uh, EPVF, not videos, just one video. And uh, the concept of EPVF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. And the way that I went about understanding this topic is something I wanted to share with you as well, kind of like the, the meta process. And initially it started out as just an outline. And the outline was um, a series of questions and it consisted of what is it? And I'm trying not to get you sick. Uh, the next one was um, how does it function? So what is the inner workings of it? The next piece was uh, why does it matter? So why are people talking about it? Does it really matter? And you actually kind of get this part through the process of learning about what it is and also how it functions, but also just trying to dive deep into that of why it matters specifically in the context of what you care about and in my context would be security. Um, you can dive deeper into the why behind this uh, concept. And then uh, for me specifically, I was curious in the security aspect. So I wanted to know the use cases of this technology within this, um, this specific context. And then uh, another thing that I was curious about as a, as a security focused individual, I wanted to know if this has been used maliciously or if the, there have been um, kind of proof of concepts created and presented. And the last one is resources for you and, and also for me. So the, uh, the premise here is I'm gonna share these notes on my website and I just wanted to give you kind of a, an idea of how I think through things. So when I have a new topic that I wanna dive into, I specifically write down questions, usually um, starting from macro and then going to micro. So I try to think of um, really any concept that I learn and kind of a, a funnel focused approach. So I start really broad and then I go narrow over time through this funnel. And then these are all uh, usually questions that are interesting to me. So I don't really necessarily start with, I want to read this blog post and then that blog post in this video. I try to focus on questions and then that's what drives the learning process for me. And hopefully that's um, a useful meta concept for you to grasp. So originally when I came across EBPF, it was probably a year ago when I was reading a book from this lady here in this presentation called Liz Rice. And she wrote a presentation on container security. And in that book, she mentioned uh, SetComp and a few other different tools that allow you to actually monitor process IDs within a container. And then those process IDs, you can then incorporate into a security policy. Um, in this presentation she did it roughly a year ago that I stumbled across as well, it talks about EPBF in more context outside of just one or two sentences in her book. And this is probably one of the good introductions or good introductory videos to watch. Re the reason being is that I was able to grasp this without actually understanding much context around EPBF or anything that revolves around the kernel and Linux and all that stuff. Um, but with that being said, and giving you the context as to how we came about this, let's get started. So what is it? What is EPBF? Well, I found this quote, and this quote is commonly referenced by this individual here that people state is kind of like one of the OGs for EPBF, and he worked, or it, I think he worked at Netflix, I don't think he's there anymore. Um, but the way that he summarizes it is EPBF does to the Linux kernel what JavaScript does to HTML. And my interpretation of that basically states that um, we're making the kernel programmable without needing to create completely new kernel modules. So we're allowing um, our ability to latch on these programs onto the kernel without modifying the kernel itself. And the reason we don't necessarily want to modify the kernel, there's many reasons. Um, two of the main reasons that I came across as to why this is hard to actually modify the kernel and add modules onto it is one, I mean, one is really hard. So it's hard to have that skill set to do that. Um, next is that the architecture for each distribution, specifically within Linux, um, varies. So you'd have to modify the module to adapt to the architecture of that kernel sometimes when you're um, including that information. And then the next one is time. So if you wanted to actually outsource this to the Linux community, it usually takes, I think they said like one to two years to actually get something incorporated into the module, depending on what it is, um, to have it go through the entire process for it finally to get incorporated and implemented into the modules of Linux, or at least in the base Linux kernel modules. And that, um, those are some of the main reasons as to why it's hard to do, you know, direct contributions and additions to the Linux kernel. And that's why EPBF is kind of such a, an important piece here is that it allows you to add modules in a dynamic fashion without actually modifying the kernel itself. So I hope that was semi-useful.
All right, so this diagram is actually comes from the documentation on EPBF. Oh, this is not it, this is here. So this, I was surprised, is actually useful um, and, and easy to read. Most documentation is useful, but depending on the author and, and the, con the contributors to that documentation, sometimes it's very, very hard to grok. And I felt that this was actually not too hard to understand. Reason being is that they gave uh, kind of simple explanations and then they gave you a lot of photos and diagrams to kind of walk you through specifically what you're talking through and, and what it means. Um, so I definitely appreciated this documentation. And that's where many of the photos that I pulled inside of this document are from. So this here gives you kind of an overview of what's happening with EPBF. So EPBF, or not what's happening with it, but where it sits. So here we have um, user space. We have um, kind of kernel space. And we have hardware. See, so these are the different layers. Uh, most of the time, you and I, we hang out here 99% of the time. Uh, there's a very small few of individuals that spend some time here when they're developing and messing around with um, the kernel. But this is where a lot of the action happens for specifically uh, an application to do what it needs to do. So this example here shows processes. So these are um, process IDs or PIDs. And then you have system calls. So these system calls are showing here is uh, write and read. And then we have send message and receive message. So EPBF, you can actually, um, usually you can write, you can write custom programs with EPBF uh, via kind of a distilled down version of the C programming language. But most of the time you're gonna use existing libraries or tools that have already been created. Reason being is that it's actually kind of complex to write EPBF programs if you're not necessarily aware of how to utilize the kernel and actually um, program and understand the, all the different kind of nuances that come with doing that. Fortunately, there's a lot of tools being created and already exist. So you can leverage those and you can attach those or hook them onto certain sections of the kernel. And I stated hook because I've, I've seen this a few times where people call this a, like a hook based um, kind of process or architecture where you're hooking these EPPF uh, programs onto certain sections. So here what we're doing is we're gonna hook this EPPF program onto these syscalls. So every time this syscall or this syscall triggers, our EPBF program is going to read that information and they're going to send that off to um, usually some sort of uh, database to store. So it's called a map database and or they're going to send that off to a um, application in the user uh, space to take action on this. So we're either going to act or we're going to store it here. And there's some other examples here, so we can um, set it up on the virtual file system. So if any files are manipulated or adjusted, depending on what the files you're interested in, you can see it there. Um, you can see they can put it down here in the storage section as well, seeing what kind of information is going in and out. Um, you can actually take certain EPPF uh, programs where there's a nuance down in my notes that talks about XDP, I think it is where this allows you to actually connect an EPF program specifically on a network card. So you can see the traffic going in and out of your, um, your environment or your system before it really hits anything else. And this actually where uh, we'll see some use cases around DDoS and how this actually speeds that up. Um, some other areas, you can check protocols, you can check sockets, another example for a syscall. And you're actually even, you can even take these EPF programs and attach them to the applications in user space. But most of the time you'll see them here in kernel space and then sometimes you'll see them up here, depending on what the use case is. So that's kind of where they can be wedged and why they're wedged in certain locations, because they're triggering off of events. And those events, once they trigger, um, you can then grab that information, either store it somewhere for later reference and or take action. All right, um, some information here, basic stuff. So this was actually, uh, EPBF was an extension, hence the word E. Um, on the old version of VPF, and VPF is Berkeley Packet Filter, was, was focused traditionally on network filtering. And this is another thing to know is that um, the, the acronym EPBF is actually kind of not useful anymore. Reason being is that people don't necessarily, they still use this, but they use it in a different context. So traditionally it was talking about filtering packets. Now it's extended so far that it does so much more than that it's hard to actually utilize the acronym for the definition of what it does. So it's kind of just a, a holding term to talk about what this program or this extended program does. Um, in 2014 is where the first EPBF uh, program I think was created and um, 1992 was when BPF was kind of pulled off. Some other stuff. 
that I thought was useful. So there's two items here. Um, so one here talks specifically about the main um, three umbrellas. So there's like three big umbrellas as to what EPBF kind of monitors or does or looks at, I guess. Um, one is just general observations of how the system is performing and what's happening. Another one is networking, so sending packets back and forth and actually um, knocking packets away and redirecting them, and or security. So that's either making observations and then potentially creating security policies that uh, make your system and specifically your containers more secure. Those are like the big umbrellas of what the use cases kind of fall into. And then this example here, this little comic, um, is actually useful to kind of walk you through as to why it's so hard to get things into kernel. It's kind of a, a bit of a joke, um, but it kind of shows you that five years later, you can finally get something put into the Linux module um, based off of your need for that. All right, so now let's go into how it functions. So now we kind of know what it is. Um, let's talk about specifically what's happening inside, or at least the process as to how this thing unfolds. And I think before I go into the details, I'm gonna take you to the overview graph. Hope I'm not making a sec. Um, this graph here, and this I pulled from a Red Canary uh, blog post. And you can see specifically they walk through the flow. So first you're gonna compile, then you're gonna load, then you verify, attach, and execute. So this is the process of, of what happens. And you can see that we have user space and kernel space. And that's the kind of overall flow of what we're gonna talk through here. And let me go back to the top. So first we have compile. So what we're gonna take is we're gonna take our, um, our restricted version of C. So when I say restricted, it's not just C programming language, but it's a, a kind of a constrained version of that. Reason being is that when we're, we're developing in the kernel, um, there's certain expectations of the code that's sent through via bytecode and it can only do certain things. And it's restricted, Re reason being is we wanna make sure that the program size is small enough that it doesn't overwhelm the kernel. Also, there's not necessarily any infinite, infinite loops that's gonna crash the kernel. And also there's uh, functions that are specifically available for the kernel that we're not using anything outside of what they're able to do. And you can see here we have a simple process that I can probably quickly walk you through where you have your C program that you've written and that's your EPBF program that's in your constrained C. You're going to run that through a uh, compiler. So there's different types of compilers you can use, but I think BCC is one of the most popular that people reference. So you're going to run that through this compiler. Once it pops out, you're going to have your bytecode. So this bytecode here is then going to then be um, uh, put into a map which is kind of just like a key value store. And also you have your program here. And that program is then gonna be put down into the kernel. So here you can see that it, uh, you can use extensions like libraries to help with um, compiling that bytecode down to uh, certain functions that you would like to leverage. And once you've run that through, it's gonna, um, you have your syscalls and then you have your verifier. And let me actually, yeah, let me walk you through one at a time because if I read the text, I, I, I don't, you know, step on my foot. So what I mentioned earlier is all accurate, but this here is becoming more rare. And the reason it's becoming more rare is because we have these libraries that already have pre-compiled programs and bytecode that you can then leverage for your, uh, your purposes. So what I've walked through here is still plausible where you write your C code, it gets compiled, that bytecode then pops out, and then what happens is this really isn't here, and you just push that directly into the kernel. But most of the time now, since there's a ton of libraries that people can leverage, um, BCC, Selenium, et cetera, et cetera, what people do here is sometimes they'll just actually kind of not do this part. And what they'll do is they'll actually just leverage the library that exists today and utilize those existing bytecode functions to then attach to certain syscalls, sockets, network cards, et cetera. And so what happens here is we're gonna leverage this information from this library to then have it um, be injected into the kernel. And there's two steps here that I wanted to highlight. So once we've gotten past the decision of what we want to use, we have our verifier and our JIT compiler. So specifically our verifier is what provides safety in our program. So we want, we want to ensure that whatever we put into the kernel is safe. And when I say safe, there's a few different restraints that we're focusing on. So one is we're ensuring that there's no infinite loops in the program. Another one is we want to ensure that there's no unsafe memory operations being done. And then the last one is we want to ensure that uh, the predefined restraints of the complexity and code size. So making sure the code isn't too big, it's not too complex, it's not gonna uh, bog down the kernel. There are other restraints that exist, but those are the main ones that I've seen discussed. So that's what the verifier is doing. It's doing its basically checks on the specific program you're sending in. Next, we have our JIT compiler. So our JIT compiler does something interesting, and I see this is not cool. Not cool internet. We're gonna change this right now because it, it annoys me. <laughs> 
All right. Now that everything is aligned and the world is okay, and I'm happy with the fact that that sentence is not in the wrong line, we could talk more about JIT compilers. All right, so the JIT compiler is going to compile our already compiled code even further. So we have our bytecode that's already compiled, which is provided by our library or through our um, compilation process. But now we're gonna take that bytecode and we're gonna run it once more through our JIT compiler. The reason we're gonna do that is we're actually gonna compile the code into something that's native to the specific architecture that kernel's sitting on to ensure that we can actually have the most optimized speed that's, that's uh, comparable to the natively compiled com code in the kernel. So long story short, is we're taking generic bytecode, so we have generic bytecode, and we're gonna compile that down to native bytecode that hopefully makes it run faster because it's native to the architecture such as x86. And that's what JIT compiler does. All right, and then uh, let's keep going. So we have attach. So this attach piece specifically is referring to the piece we've already talked about, um, but there's a few items that I'll highlight here that I've highlighted in my, uh, my text. So when attaching EPBF programs to certain parts of the system, they have these things called uprobes, kprobes, and trace points. So trace points are predefined locations as to where you can send um, EPBF programs to get connected. Um, kprobes and uprobes, the U stands for user, and the K stands for kernel. So that means that our kprobes can be um, attached to kernel items, and our uprobes can be attached to user space items. And that's what we're seeing down here. It's just an example of an EPBF program being attached to sockets and syscalls. All right, and then the next piece here is giving an example. So you can actually see kind of what's happening um, when that's attached. So this example here is specifically looking at a uh, open call. And I pulled this information, I think I have it linked here, not here, uh, from this, this uh, report. It's, it's not a book. It, she calls it a report because it's 60 pages. So it's kind of like a baby book, a mini book. So in this example, we're going to write an EPBF program that actually can capture the open syscall event and record that. So in this example, we have our user space, our kernel space, our application, and our application is going to do an open on a file. So when it does that open syscall, our EPBF program is gonna trigger on that open syscall that's, that's utilized. And once it triggers, there's two things here. So the, the kernel code here is gonna handle um, two kind of sub operations which is uh, enter and exit of that file when opening it. And you can see there's the start portion and then the, the event that happens. So once this portion happens and that syscall is run, um, we're gonna write that data and that event out to our map, which I referred to earlier, which is basically a database that houses the information. And this is just a tool that's gonna help with um, gathering that information. So what we really care about here is ensuring that our EPF program can do this process here of triggering, once it triggers, we take that information and we send that up to the map. Now, I think I have some information on the map here, but if not, then I'll give a quick explanation. Okay, it was sitting in plain sight, right in front of me. So, I think it's probably better if I do it here. This little side note is just giving an explanation of what the map piece is. So we can see the map database here and we can see the map here. These are connected, basically because when our EPVF event triggers, it sends that information to the map. So why is it sending to the map? The map itself does two things. So one, it maintains state, allowing us to actually utilize that information at a later, later point. So if we send that information up to our map database, um, we have our user space here and our kernel space here. So our application up here in user space, they can then pull from this to do other things, but they also can send information here for our EPVF program to pull from as well. And this maintaining state it's kind of like a translation layer between the kernel space and user space, where we can translate this observed event into either an action or a future maybe uh, forensics investigation or whatever else. So this database stores state in between the two kind of uh, universes of user and kernel. And we're sending stuff back and forth into that from the EPBF up and then from the user space applications down and then back and forth. Next part is talking about why does this matter? But specifically, why does this matter in the context of my interest, which is uh, security? So why does this matter within the context of security? Well, I've given a brief explanation as to why I think that's the case. So one is that as the world kind of transitions from the traditional kind of on-premise world to the cloud native uh, world where everybody kind of utilizes different types of public providers such as AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, 
um, they tend to, when migrating, if done correctly, adopt the best practices within the cloud ecosystem instead of porting over specifically what they've done here and thinking that it'll work here. Most of the time it doesn't work. And uh, some of the practices that they adopt is the um, process of ephemeral architecture, specifically uh, infrastructure that goes up and down quickly via clusters of Kubernetes, uh, pods, nodes, etc., and containers. So I wanted to give a quick kind of photo here to show you what I'm talking about. Um, so here we have a cluster. So this is a cluster in Kubernetes. And here we have a node pool, um, some nodes and pods. So our node pool aggregates a bunch of nodes and our node is this blue section here and our pods are this white section here. Our pods um, preferably have just one container per pod, but sometimes they're mixed up. And the issue here is with traditional security detection tools and monitoring, um, they tend to be uh, IP address focused. And if they're only focused on IP addresses and things that are more macro and, and by nature for observability, this is almost useless if the cloud native approach is adopted. When what I mean by that is if in this, in this container, and actually let me ensure that I'm saying this correctly. Okay, cool. I was doing it right. So um, with our traditional security, so I'll say our, our TS, our traditional security tools, they're observing the containers inside of this pod. So let's say, for instance, that there's one container inside of this pod for now. And if we're checking the IP of this and we're utilizing the cloud native approach and, and best practices, that means that these containers should be ephemeral and they should be dying off and, and being created consistently. So this entire node pool should be um, going in and out of existence. And when I say in and out of existence, that means the IP addresses are consistently changing. And we're always tearing down and spinning up different types of clusters and things like that to ensure that either we're um, updating our systems and we're um, correlating to traffic and all the other things that are associated with up and down of clusters within um, Kubernetes. And if that's happening correctly, that means the IP addresses that we're tracking within our, um, our traditional security tool are kind of useless because we're not necessarily tracking the same container over time. They're changing over time. So we have to probably use IP tables, which are a pain for a lot of um, practitioners, especially when they're, they have large clusters. So that's where EPVF programs come into play and they actually can help specifically with this issue um, in a really robust fashion. Additionally, traditional security, they tend to lack the ability to look into namespaces within a uh, Linux ecosystem because it's too granular and it's too focused down on certain areas. And that's kind of where this comes into play and EPVF walks in and is like, hey, I got this. And this is a graph that I pulled from another little like mini book um, that I linked below on security observability with EPVF. And this gives you kind of a snapshot as to the difference. So we can see traditional network monitoring um, tools, they tend to focus on the packets and those packets tend to have source destination IP, source destination port and their protocol. This is like a super high level version of what they can view. Um, most of which is always changing within a cloud native ecosystem. But if you use a cloud native um, security observability tool like EPBF, you actually see a lot more. So you see the socket, you see the Kubernetes um, pod labels and namespaces, you see all the information in the Linux kernel, um, and you also see additional network information. And by doing this, this allows you to actually identify a container and stay consistent with that container over time. Reason being is that you can actually track that process which containers are basically containerized processes. You can track that PID or that process and ensure that it's, um, you know, it's doing as you expect and it's not going out of band or do anything crazy. Also, you can track specific domains that are connecting in and out of that container, other um, pods and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it gives you that additional granularity and that kind of real time nature of tracking things within the kernel um, to give you that ability to create stronger security policies and actually uh, mitigate any potential events that occur. All right, and now we're gonna to get to the security use cases. I'm gonna close this stuff first. We talked about that, talked about that, talked about that. Uh, maybe come back to that. All right, so security use cases. Uh, I have a few here, I think I have like four or five. I'll quickly go through them. So first is crypto jacking. So crypto jacking is a very common attack vector with a lot of threat actors, specifically sophisticated threat actors that wanna do something that's not, attribu not attributable. So what they're going to do is they're going to basically jump into your um, Kubernetes cluster, get into it somehow. And once they're into it, they're going to basically spin up their own specific node with a series of containers or one container. And they're going to actually run a mining rig. And that mining rig is going to mine Monero, likely. And they're going to then take the, the funds from that mining and, and be happy and run off. 
So this is a huge issue and it costs a lot of money. Um, there's actually a really good report here from Sysdig that actually walks through the specific cost for mining. And I think there's a little thing here. You can see that the total cost of crypto jacking. So they, they mine around 8,000, which costs around 430,000 in bills for a provider if you crypto jack on somebody else's, um, somebody else's dime. So it's a, it's a pretty drastic cost for if somebody gets in there and crypto jacks. So this is an example from I think the uh, book that I referenced, the first one, and here it gives you an explanation as to how EVF can actually help mitigate or observe if that happens. Um, so here we have an example. So we have user space here. We have kernel down here. And on the left-hand side is the old school method. On the right-hand side is the new school method with EVF. So in our um, pod, we have a few containers. So we have three containers and a sidecar. So our sidecar, if you're not aware of that, basically uh, extrapolates the uh, standardized functions that most containers would do, such as like networking and routing and things like that. And you put it into a specific container that actually takes that, takes that job. So we have some other pods and we have a pod here. So the, the thing here is that we have, an, we have an attacker that's gotten into our Kubernetes cluster somehow. Once they've gotten in there, they're actually gonna spin up their own specific pod. So they're able to start crypto jacking. The issue here is that our sidecars, one of their functionalities is for observability and security. So ensuring that no pod has been spun up and it's doing anything it shouldn't be. Well, if I'm a sidecar and I'm specifically in a pod and another pod is spun up outside of my observability, then I'm not gonna be able to see anything that's happening in this pod because it's blocked off from this sidecar's um, observability kind of, uh, I'd say, realm of reality. And if that's happening, they can spin it up and they can do whatever they want. But if we have a new architecture with EPBF based into the kernel, if a new pod is spun up, irrelevant of what sidecars are sitting where, we can actually see that this, this pod has been spun up and we can see what's happening due to the fact that EPBF is actually checking the syscalls on the entirety of that cluster and all the pods inside of it um, because that, that kernel is sitting on that VM or that machine. So this gives you additional visibility to actually track that information. Um, this next one here is quite interesting. So this is pulled from the other, uh, this, this other kind of book-ish, like baby book that talks about security observability. So in this use case, they talk about um, a new form of policy creation, which a lot of people are doing within the cloud native ecosystem, which is uh, observe, observation-based policies. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna observe our apps, um, usually when they're initially spun up. So this is, I don't think I wrote it here, but there's an interesting concept about um, entropy inside of applications when you spin them up in a cluster. So um, with entropy, when you spin up a new uh, container, say container one, over time, as time unfolds, um, the container shouldn't change, but sometimes they do because people, you know, SSH uh, into the container to, to make new configurations and update uh, vulnerabilities, et cetera, or, uh, make patches. Another one is um, people may have exploited into this and there could be hackers sitting in there. Um, there's a variety of other reasons why this container's state would actually change over time. But if we spin up a new container, container two, and we continuously spin up this container on a recurring basis to ensure that we're you know, doing patches and everything else we wanna do, but we're doing it based off of the image at the very beginning and not necessarily changing the um, container and runtime and we're changing it prior, then we're actually setting ourselves up for, sec for success. Reason being is that um, when monitoring this application, we're seeing it in its, um, in its best state. We're not necessarily looking at a old container that's been out for a while that's likely um, not uh, being as authentic as we would like it to. So the long story short here is that if we have a fresh container that we've just spun up, we're going to observe what it's doing over time. And as we observe it, we're gonna then create a policy based off of those observations. And that policy is likely going to be an allow list instead of a block list because allow lists tend to be best practice for this kind of stuff. And in this container, we're gonna track all the different syscalls and all the different things that it does over time. And as we track that, we're gonna then bake that into a template. And that template is gonna be a template. Usually I think it's a YAML file. And no, that's YAML file. That template is gonna basically have those policies baked in. And that's what we're gonna do here. And this is gonna be uh, an example for Selenium Tetra Tetra Tetragon, which is a product that uses EPBF. And in this example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a specific um, policy. And that policy is gonna be in a YAML file that basically denies privileged, um, denies privileged pods from being spun up. 
we're going to trace if that happens. If so, we're going to we're going to immediately block it because it's going to be an allow list that says, you know, everything that's already configured in privilege pods is done. So if I ever see this anywhere else, it's immediately denied. And we can see here we have an attacker that is hacking into the, the to the host in the cluster, and they've actually tried to spin up a privilege pod. But what we've done is we can see that this specific value is something that we're tracking. So the capsis admin is a um, specific. Uh, I think it's a syscall or a value that's put inside of the terminal, you can immediately kill that process. When you kill that process of trying to actually create a new uh, privileged pod, we're gonna then um, not just kill it, but we're also gonna send that up to the map and have it for observability later on. So that's one of the other really cool use cases. And that bring me, brings me to another point where you can actually track um, the commands put into a terminal. So you can track every single command put in the terminal and see what those are. So you can then block certain commands as well. So if there are specific commands that are utilized for different types of malware variants that are prominently used, then you can actually block those um, if it's not necessarily common in your environment. Another really, really, really cool use case. Um, so DDoS prevention. So this isn't necessarily useful. I mean, it's useful, but it's not relevant for many people. Um, and specifically here, Cloudflare has been utilizing EPBF for a long time, not a long time, like since like 2017 or something. And Cloudflare specifically, they wrote this really interesting blog post uh, back in, I think it's 2017, 18, 2018, where they did a uh, performance comparison between how many packets can we drop with EPBF on a network card and how many packets can we drop with the, the traditional methods that we've used in the past. And in the comparison, uh, like I stated previously, they're using a specific type of program that's called um, uh, XDP or Express Data Path. And they're using this to attach that EPBF program on their NIC card. And down here, we can see a comparison where they um, set up a specific uh, benchmark where they're looking at a specific NIC card with all the same environmental variables. And you can see that uh, the XDP EPBF program was able to drop around 10 million packets per second in comparison to all the other methods. And you can see that none of them were anywhere close to being as good as this. So it just shows how useful it is to actually have something sitting in the kernel and so close to the edge where it can, where it can knock down these packets in a, in a rapid fashion. And this is also in 2018, so I'm sure that they've improved this somehow since. Uh, the next one here is uh, creating an interesting sandbox. So when you're analyzing malware, um, you tend to use a sandbox and for some malware, the more sophisticated variants, they have a series of checks. And these are just examples, but these are some of the checks that this sophisticated piece of malware will do. And it'll say, okay, um, is this uh, machine that I've just, just gained access to, you know, how many CPUs are inside of it? Uh, has it slept um, for longer than a minute? Um, what's the size of the RAM, the recent files, assets, et cetera. And the reason they're doing these checks is because if these checks fail or a certain number of these fail, this malware is likely sitting on a sandbox, which is a fake machine that allows people to analyze the malware itself. So what the malware is trying to do is trying to kill itself off so you can't observe its behavior as a malware analysis or a malware analyst to create detections to find it. Um, so it's more sophisticated malware that tries to avoid being observed by sandboxes. Uh, but with, the, um, with this approach with EPBF, you can actually create a um, program that sits within that sandbox and ensures that if any of these checks occur, you can see if they're happening um, but also you can uh, provide fake responses back to the, the malware, which is kind of crazy. So say the malware is running these checks, and as it's running those checks to see if that's true, the EPBF program sitting in the kernel can actually pick up each one of these syscalls, and when they pick up each one of these syscalls to get the response, they actually provide fake responses back. So it says, okay, you want RAM size that's uh, more than four gigs? Sure, I'll send you six. Uh, do you want a hard drive that's larger than 60 gigs? Sure, I'll send you 80. And even though the gigs are actually 60 and four, we can lie to the malware with these false responses, um, which also can be used maliciously, but it's, it's useful here for sandboxing as well. And with that being said, we'll do the malicious use cases. So there are, I think, like five or six DEF CON presentations. Um, this one I felt was probably the best. And in this one here, this individual talks through a series of use cases that he's found um, that you can actually maliciously utilize EVF for. I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. I highly recommend checking the presentation out. Um, so the first one is data illusion. This is very similar to the point that I just made above for the sandboxing, but in a malicious context. So here, um, it's based off of the process ID. 
So let's do a picture, draw a picture somewhere. Sorry, there's more space here. So we have one terminal here and one terminal here. So these are two users on the same host or whatever else. So this is a T1, T2. So both of these have their own PIDs, these terminals. And they're both trying to access, let's say, file one. So what this malware can do is, or yeah, if, if you create an EPF program that performs in a malicious fashion, what happens is say terminal one wants to read uh, this file one. And say file one says uh, data, and this is what the authentic file says, data. Well, now we have terminal two, and it has a uh, PID, and let's say this is PID two, PID one. So the EPBF program, when it, when it sees uh, PID two, try to reach out to file one and read it, instead of providing the authentic response of data, it's gonna send a fake response of dog. So this is the fake response, and it's gonna send that back to this terminal. And the reason it can do this is because this EVF program is actually reading in real time the specific terminal that's reaching out to this file to read it. And once it tries to read it, we can actually manipulate the data quickly and send them back fake data, which is another uh, crazy use case. All right, this next one here is uh, invisible root, what I called it. And invisible root is another example here. So let's go back up to the top to draw a picture. All right, so say we've created an EVF program and we've stowed that away in the kernel. And we have E for EVF program. And then we have a specific user of one. So this user of one is currently not root user. But they've installed this EVF program maliciously in the kernel. And basically any time that they try to log into this machine that's sitting uh, here, when they try to log in and they use sudo, what the EPF program is going to do is it's going to look specifically for this user, which has an associated PID to it. And then when that user specifically tries to call out that syscall of going to sudo, it's immediately going to allow them to have sudo. So you don't necessarily have to put in a username. You don't have to put in a password. They don't have to put in anything. They just immediately get in without having to log in at all, which is another really interesting malicious use case. And then the last one is you can't see me. And this use case is kind of extreme, but it's still an interesting one where you're, as a malicious user, you're trying to basically ensure that the defender is unable to actually view the fact that your EPVF program exists on their host. So say you've installed your EPVF program and it's a malicious program sitting in the kernel again. The defender has a series of tools that they can use to see if that program or see what programs exist on the machine today. One of those tools can be BPF tool. So you can utilize this tool to see, okay, what programs are running on this kernel today? When you do that, if you set up the program correctly as a hacker, um, what's going to happen, or a malicious user, not, so not say hacker, let's say malicious user. So malicious user um, puts their EVF program on there. When you run your, your tool, it's immediately going to kill this tool's ability to see what programs are run. So it's, it's kind of, you know, a little extreme, but it just shows that you can actually uh, make yourself invisible to those that want to see you by any, unable, enabling them allow to actually see the access and do what they want to do with actually observing you. So um, that is probably a longer video than I expected. And here's a bunch of resources. So I'd recommend if you're interested as a noob reading these and consuming this content in this direction, in this order, instead of um, doing it randomly, I would say start from the top, work your way down. With that being stated, internet, appreciate the time. And I'll see you next video. Mm -hmm.